tonight, the darkness that leads some women to kill their children and themselves. There's nothing new in the idea of baby blues, postnatal depression, but one in 500 may suffer from postpartum psychosis with catastrophic consequences for some. I started getting unpleasant thoughts about Oliver dropping them on purpose and throwing him down the stairs. I was just so frightened. I didn't want to hurt my boy. In a Newsnight exclusive report, we hear how the problems can sometimes be predicted and prevented. A person can move from being relatively amenable and understanding of her situation to floridly unwell, psychotic, delusional and paranoid in the space of just two or three days. We'll ask what more can be done to alert women and their families to the dangers. And if you thought some British men had peculiar views about rape, how about this US Senate candidate on rape and pregnancy? If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. We'll hear how Congressman Todd Akin's views have become a weapon for the Democrats. Rape is rape. Also tonight, remember this. You can't borrow your way out of debt. So why is borrowing going up? Big economic minds have advice for the Prime Minister. Good evening. For some new parents, the great joy of having a baby is made difficult by so-called baby blues or postnatal depression. And for some women, it leads to something much more severe, a devastating mental illness when you lose touch with reality. Postpartum psychosis affects up to 1,500 women each year in Britain, and in the worst cases, it can lead to a mother killing herself or even her baby. Because it's poorly understood, doctors and midwives often don't recognize the symptoms, but women who have suffered from it are now trying to change this. Newsnight has been given unique access to the lives of three women who all became ill shortly after giving birth. Caroline Hawley's film contains some upsetting and graphic content. I was just so frightened. I didn't want to hurt my boy. And I knew somebody had to help me. Women are more at risk of severe mental illness after giving birth than at any other time in their lives. One day I, I thought about doing it, about smothering the boys while they had their lunchtime sleep. Daksha Emsom did kill her baby and then herself while suffering from postpartum psychosis. What I saw that night when I came home, my beautiful wife and daughter, even now I can't comprehend that. We've been given extraordinary access to the lives of three women who all became ill soon after giving birth. Shelley Blanchard's baby is due in the next few weeks and she's come in for her final checkup. <laughs> Just got kicked that, yeah. <laughs> but it's not the baby that medical staff are worried about. It's her. One in ten new mothers suffer from postnatal depression. But Shelley's at risk of something much more serious, postpartum psychosis. Mental health problems of varying degrees will affect one in four of us at some point in our lives. But women who've just given birth are particularly susceptible to the most serious illness. I'm scared. I'm emotional now. Um, I'm scared oh, I'm going to harm the baby. Or um, I'm, I've read some things that... Um, sorry. I've read some things that where women think that... The, the baby's talking to them and telling them to do things and, and, that, and, and that the baby will get taken away from me. That's my biggest fear. It's not known exactly what causes postpartum psychosis, but the massive hormonal changes that follow childbirth are thought to play a significant role. Everything going well since I last saw you? I mean, mood-wise, I am struggling. I know I am. I'm quite agitated. Um, my sleep pattern's terrible. One in 500 women who've just given birth will suffer from postpartum psychosis, and it can strike out of the blue. 
Good to see you. The majority of women who have a postpartum psychosis or a very, very severe postpartum depressive illness will have no obvious risk factors. It'll be their first ever illness. They might have been ill before. They have no family history. But there is a proportion of women who you can predict. Shelley is one of them. She's at high risk because she has bipolar disorder and that means she has a one in two chance of becoming severely ill in the first few weeks after having her baby. Everyone looking after her knows they need to be alert. Dr Nick Best is a psychiatrist who specialises in caring for pregnant women and new mothers with mental health problems. Okay, well, sort of long time no see since I yeah. saw you at Andover Community Team Base. Mm. So He'll be seeing Shelley regularly over the next few months and she also gets home visits from the community psychiatric nurse. You know, when the mood change happens, if it is going to happen, it can be fairly rapid. So that's where the you know, eyes and ears of the midwife and health visitor are helpful. Right, OK. And, you know, that's where if we got a call from anybody expressing concern, including Lee, we'd come out almost immediately. Right, OK, that's cool. It's the speed with which the condition develops, together with the severity, which make it so dangerous. A person can move from being relatively amenable and understanding of her situation to floridly unwell, psychotic, delusional and paranoid in the space of just two or three days. Dave Emson knows how serious postpartum psychosis can be. I came home about half past five or so and as I got to the front door I smelt a burning smell. Normally I'd call, call out Tatcha, monkey, honey, I'm home and she replied that she's here and oh Dave and, and I'd hear this little babbling broke, babbling away and it was quiet, it was a silence. When Dave's daughter Freya was just three months old, his wife Daksha stabbed her and then set both herself and the baby on fire in their bedroom. Daksha died from her burns nearly three weeks later. She'd left a note. Dave, I'm absolutely convinced now of bad forces being at work here. Our baby has to be protected from these forces. And I'm going to protect her. I love her. She means everything to me. And I'll, and I'll do whatever I can to protect her from evil. It's only now 12 years since Daksha's death that Dave can bring himself to sort out her old textbooks. She studied psychiatry, in part because she'd suffered severe depression herself for years and she was about to become a consultant when she died. But few people knew about her condition. She was afraid of the stigma. The inquiry into her death led to new guidelines in the NHS for the treatment of staff with mental illness. Dave's now writing a book about her story to help other people in similar situations. Primarily is for Dacia to speak through me, to actually to speak to uh, brothers and sisters, people that are suffering, fellow mental health workers, people that are suffering with mental health uh, conditions, that you are not alone, you do not need to be alone. Shelley Blanchard is about to give birth. Yeah. Shelley's husband Lee is in the army, posted in Northern Ireland, but he's been able to come home for a few weeks. And he's worried about what will happen to her after the birth. 
Well, it's not baby blues, is it? It's it's quite severe, worst case scenario. You know, I could end up without a wife and without a child. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's, it, it's worrying. But the fact that we're already, the, the knowledge that we have enables us to understand or, or, or um, look for any signs of it. And with a network of medical carers, it's, a, you know, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of people she's got caring for her. Shelley's labour has gone on for two days and she's just had a forceps delivery. Just down there. No. Hello, Mum. Hello, little boy. He's really alert, isn't he? Hello, little mum. Mm. Her teenage son, Matthew, is there as well. He licks his lips a lot. That very first evening, she starts her antipsychotic drugs. And how are you um, coping emotionally? How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm doing really well. I'm just happy to have Oliver. He's just so gorgeous. Yeah. Oliver is now a week old. Yeah, Shelley is relaxed and happy with the support she's getting. But Lee is going back to Northern Ireland soon. Good boy. Hello, Dr. Best. It's Shelley Blanchard here. Um, I'm aware you're on leave at the moment, but um, I wondered if you could give me a call as I'm feeling rather unwell at the moment. Thank you. Shelley's mood has begun to drop. She's stopped taking the antipsychotic drugs because they make her drowsy. She knows she needs help. That would be enough to get rid of an elephant. It's scary especially feeling the way I'm feeling. A few weeks later, she's admitted to a special unit in Winchester where mothers and their babies can be kept safe during treatment. Um, I started getting uh, unpleasant thoughts about Oliver, about wanting to hurt him, um, dropping him on purpose and throwing him down the stairs. I was just so frightened, I didn't want to hurt my boy. And I knew somebody had to help me. But the thoughts were getting stronger and more frequent. So um, I had to tell somebody. I had to get some help. OK, I've got a heel meds here for you, Shelley. Do you want me to put them in your hand? Yeah. You're holding baby, right. aren't you? And that's the haloperidol and the um, lithium that you've got in some water. Okay. Sometimes I feel a bit lost being in here. I feel lonely sometimes. But Lee comes in to see me every day. That's nice. It's, it's nice to have a visitor because um, it breaks up the day a little bit because otherwise I think they can be a bit long and drawn out. With postpartum psychosis still poorly understood and frequently misdiagnosed, perinatal psychiatrists and mental health workers are here to listen to a woman who's been through it herself. I became psychotic just a few days after leaving hospital when late one night, having just fed Finlay, who was still very much in the cast iron grip of a two hourly feeding routine, I placed his sleeping body down on the bed beside me and my brain simply snapped. It felt as though somebody had flicked a switch in my head. And I looked at him and was filled with an urge to kill him. I, I put my hand around his tiny neck, not yet strong enough to hold up his own head, and began to squeeze. I wasn't trying to harm him, I knew I mustn't do that, but I wanted to know if I was capable of it. And whether it's true or not, I convinced myself that I was. Jo, once a high-flying school teacher and head of maths, became ill after her second son was born. She'd never suffered mental health problems before and was terrified her children would be taken away. She decided her only way out was to commit suicide and take Tom and Finn with her. One day I, I thought about doing it, about smothering the boys while they had their lunchtime sleep. I was very meticulous in my thinking. 
I had to make sure that the boys and the dog were dead before I took my own life because I couldn't risk them surviving if I didn't. I think you have to cut, you see those grey, I think we have to cut around those grey lines. I'm just thinking. Jo is fully recovered now, but she spent more than six months in a secure psychiatric hospital while her husband cared for Tom and Finn. Come on, Jess. Jo now feels compelled to raise awareness of the condition, particularly with health workers. Women are dying simply because they've had a baby, um, which, you know, shouldn't be happening. And I, I feel very strongly that because I, be, I came so close to losing my life that um, I, I, I'm in a position to be able to talk about the extremes of the illness um, and, and a lot of other sufferers are no longer with us, sadly. What's the matter? Tell mummy what's the matter. <laughs> what was that? Oliver's now five months old and both he and Shelley are doing well. Doing a weird look. What's going on? What's Molly doing? If I wasn't able to go into the unit, I think that I probably would have ended up taking an overdose, um, possibly killing myself. Because um, I, you know, I was out of control. It was such a dark time, but out of that dark time, I've managed to learn a little bit more about myself. And, and, and I think to come out of it and feel so happy. I'm actually feeling really well now. I just, I feel, I could actually possibly say that I feel fantastic. Well, I'm joined now by Joe Lyle, whom you saw in that report, and by Dr. Nisha Shah, who's a consultant psychiatrist who runs a perinatal mental health service in North London. Joe, thanks very much for talking about this publicly. Um, what, what do you think mothers and healthcare professionals most need to know about this? I think they most need to know that it, that it exists because um, there's, there is so little awareness amongst mothers, about, uh, well, amongst the, the general public and health professionals. And I think it, it was very clear that the lady who had bipolar, Shelley, um, they said she's got a team all looking out for her. And that doesn't happen for other women if they haven't got an existing mental health problem. That doesn't happen. Uh, uh, nobody, uh, lots and lots of people around me realised something was wrong and said, would say to me or my husband, something's wrong with Jo, is she all right? My mum said, it doesn't look like Jo, it looks like, it seems like somebody else is inside her body. But none of us had any idea that I might be ill. And presumably, you were told by healthcare professionals about all kinds of physical things that could go wrong in childbirth, because everybody is, but not about the mental side? No, and in fact, a woman is more likely to have a mental health problem, uh, either antenatally or postnatally, than, than any physical health problem. It's, it's the biggest um, health problem that women in the perinatal period uh, are likely to suffer. Uh, Dr Shah, um, there remains a stigma with all mental health problems, doesn't it? And particularly with, when it's got to do with children and childbirth, you're supposed to be happy. And if you're not, it's, a, it, it's even more of a stigma, perhaps. I think that's absolutely right and I think that exactly what Joe's saying in terms of needing to raise awareness is really impeded by people's fear of what's going to happen when they present to a health professional with a problem that is out of the range of what's considered to be normal. Um, there's a real anxiety that, you know, we, we hear about things like baby pee, we know, we know about what happens when children are mistreated and all mothers worry about not treating their children properly and being separated from them. Um, and that prevents people from coming forwards. And how, what, what do you do with healthcare professionals to say, you've got to be aware of this, you've got to be sens sensitive to it, and you're there to help? Uh, you're not there simply to intervene to protect the child, you're also there to help a mother. Um, I think perinatal mental health services that have slowly started growing um, since, really, since the tragic death of um, Dr. Empson in 2000, 
do incorporate education of healthcare professionals into their remit. It's an awful lot of what we do is to spend time making sure that maternity departments at the Whittington where I work, we spend time training midwives, talking to obstetricians, making sure that everybody knows that mental health problems are very common, that they are very, very treatable, and that there are services in some places that exist to try and help people deal with them. Did, did you feel the stigma? Did you feel that you should hide it? Or, or was it, I mean, how did it, how did it creep up in you? Or how did it, how did you become aware that you had to start talking about it? Um, well, <clears throat> well, at first I hid it for months because um, having a baby is meant to be a very joyful time. And mm. I, I had started to believe, I'd started to have delusions that I was evil and that I wasn't supposed to be a mother. Well, how do you tell anybody that when you believe it so completely that, well, I, I actually believe that if I told anybody that boys would be taken away and adopted and that I would be put into prison, even though I hadn't done anything wrong. Um, and I, I, I just had a moment of clarity one day and, and realised I needed help, but this was some months after I'd become ill. But when, from what Dr Shah was saying, did, was it difficult to ask for help, not just because of the stigma, but because you thought the boys might be taken away? It, it, it was. Um, I had no idea I was as ill as I was, I'd, you know, I'd lost all sense of reality. Um, and I just went to my GP and said, I've made plans to kill myself, the boys and the dog, and I, I think I might be ill. Um, and that was on a Monday, and by Friday I was on a patient on a, lo I was a patient on a locked uh, psychiatric unit mm. without my baby. But it is treatable, that's the whole point. Of it is, I mean, it's, it's not um, always straightforward. Um, because they're, you know, we're all individuals, and different treatments work better with different uh, with different women. And it, it didn't help that I went months before I had any treatment at all. That definitely complicated things a lot. Um, but there are uh, psychological interventions. There's medication, and I was treated eventually with ECT, and that was what cured me and took uh, cured my psychosis. Um, but there, but there are problems with each. Obviously, ECT is very controversial and there's a lot of problems associated with it, although when it works, it's very, very successful. Um, medication has all sorts of side effects. You know, you could see just from the film that one of them is unprecedented weight gain. And, you know, I, in, in, in six months in hospital, I put on, you know, five stone. And it's extraordinary. And, and psychological interventions sometimes aren't enough you need you need some sort of chemical intervention as well so there's problems with each but using a combination of them all um it's it's possible to have a full recovery and we we said earlier in the report that, that it is treatable but uh, and it's also sometimes you can predict it uh, but sometimes presumably you can't and it just just uh, creeps up on people yes i mean postpartum psychosis is a subtype really i think Perinatal psychiatrists in general find that postnatal depression encompasses many things and I think there is also this sort of um, blurring between perhaps baby blues which really is not an illness, it's something completely different. And it's, it's pretty common. It, 50 to 60 percent of first time mothers will experience baby blues so mm. that's not something that we're concerned about but there is a real need for awareness and knowledge to be able to differentiate baby blues from postnatal depression, postnatal depression from postpartum psychosis which is a different illness and therefore does require a different set of treatments. Okay we'll leave it there but thank you both very much.